Hello and welcome to Tales and Trails. I'm Minnie Menon. Traditional Indian textiles hide a lot within their fold. They tell the story of the regions they come from, of the culture there, art, faith. Sometimes they also tell a lot more. Take for example the Parsi Gara, which tells a tale of voyages on the sea, of old trading routes and the rise of a community. Take a look. The Gara Sari is unlike any Sari made in India. This traditional fare, often a family heirloom passed down in Parsi homes, is also one of the most enduring symbols of the heydays of Parsi enterprise. The 19th century, when Parsi traders took to the high seas to forge new trading ties. The roots of the Gara Sari lie in the thriving Parsi trade with China in the 19th century. Tulsi Vatsal, co-author of Peonies and Pagodas, a book that tells the story of the Gara Sari, traces its history. Well, for us today, the Parsi Gara, that is these silk saris that were embroidered with Chinese motifs, and imported from China are a reminder of the enormous trade between India and China in the 19th centuries which was spearheaded by the Parsis. When these garas were born in the 19th century especially the late last decades of the 19th century they also made a statement. By this time uh, the Parsis were very successful, not only as professionals, as lawyers and doctors, but as entrepreneurs and businessmen with steel and cotton factories. And they and their wives were common presence at official functions, at public meetings and so on. And while the men wore western dress now, by now, the Parsi women still wore saris, but they were saris which were totally different from anything that had been seen in India. And these saris with their exotic motives suggested wealth, it suggested sophistication, and it suggested that the Parsis were forward looking. They were not going to wear the, they had abandoned the traditional saris that were available to the Parsis. The introduction of these saris into India in the 19th century are of course a byproduct of the China trade. And this trade was, was quite fascinating because it was a three-corner trade and it involved things as different as tea and cotton in the beginning and opium. The last came to dominate trade and by the 1860s opium accounted for 90% of Indian exports to China. The trade was lucrative and it was controlled by Parsi businessmen. Many fortunes were made. Interestingly, the Gara Sari is closely linked to the opium trade. The empty crates that had carried opium to China were brought back by Parsi businessmen filled with presents for their wives which included the exotic embroidered Chinese silks that were by now a rage in London. The reason why Parsis became attracted to these embroidered garments was as a response to British tastes. Now, surprisingly, in the 1870s, which was the heyday of uh, imperialism, there was a kind of craze for oriental goods in Britain, France and other western countries. And this was due to growing uh, tourism, to the new technology of photography and all the big department stores in London started stocking these goods. And amongst them the most important one that which really determined the uh, cultural uh, uh, fashions in those days was of course Liberties which was originally called East India House and it had all kinds of oriental wares 
and embroidered goods from China became very popular among uh, British uh, women. They would do white on white embroidery for wedding gowns, they used embroideries for tablecloths, for bed linen, they would make them into purses and notebooks and so on. And by this time the Parsis who were who had prospered so much as a result of their uh, association with their Brit with the British, they saw how much Chinese embroidered goods were uh, desired amongst women in Britain, and they decided that they, why not import them themselves? They they were not allowed to wear dresses at the time. So they did the next best thing, they got this material and wore it as saris. And now the interesting thing was because as I said there were no tradition of saris there, the first, some of the earliest specimens of available garas we see have got borders on all four sides. They are obviously copies of some tablecloths or shawls, the Parsi women would uh, select from pattern books that were available in China now in profusion whichever patterns they liked and then these saris would be made and uh, some of the patterns for instance really resonated with the saris. There was a pattern of the Chinese phoenix. Now this phoenix uh, may have derived, it's probably derived from an ancient uh, Persian symbol, a Persian phoenix called the Simurg, who during the period when the Sasanian kingdom was at its height, you know, this symbol made its way along with trade to China and was adapted and it became the Chinese Luan. Then the Chinese used uh, symbols like fish, which for Parsis were also quite auspicious. So they chose these symbols, they chose other symbols without perhaps realizing their meaning and the Chinese would now make them for the export market. So what were originally symbols which had deep meaning, uh, auspicious symbols say a spotted deer, if you were sh shown the spotted deer next to a wheel, for the Chinese it meant the first sermon in Banaras and all these had when they were made for the Chinese market had specific meanings but when they were made for export became merely decorative and they would wear them, they started wearing them differently also, you know, the saris because they, as they grew more westernized as uh, Chinese, uh, they started wearing saris along with uh, flouncy and frilly blouses with stockings and high heel shoes the saris would be pinned by a European brooch. So they became more and more, uh, they kind of adapted to westernization without completely giving into it at that time. While the motifs were often Chinese and the sensibility western, the gara did have a bit of the traditional as well. Its name, which comes from the Gujarati word galo for width. The heydays of the Gara was the period between 1870 and the early 1920s when demand soared so high among the wealthy Parsis that the Gara was sold by weight and produced extensively across China and even in India. Surat was quick to emerge as a Gara hub. Over time, silks gave way to georgettes and chiffons and heavy embroidery to sleeker borders. However, over time, international events and changing tastes hurt the Gara. There was a war between China and Japan, then the Second World War came and then the communist takeover of China and then most of the Parsis left. Many of them had moved to Hong Kong also by then and uh, had a strong presence there. But then after the end of the Second World War, this thing declined. And then also uh, these, there was a time when these garas became very unfashionable 
and uh, they were looked on as being uh, too traditional to be worn. So Parsi women would, uh, many ladies remember how their mothers would sell them for bartans to passers, you know, these people who pass by or they would cut up the saris to make them into little blouses or purses or, or so on. But of course, as everything, the cycle has again changed and once again, garas have become very fashionable and much desired. So people are willing to pay huge sums for old pieces. But there are lots of uh, entrepreneurs now making garas, changing the styles a little bit, the designs, the patterns and so on to suit modern taste. So they're making a big comeback. The gara today is seeing a revival as new innovations are being made. The sheer old world charm of its exquisitely embroidered designs is also helping the gara make a comeback in many homes. Thank God for that. The gara is not just a sari, it is a symbol of an era and of a community. Thanks so much for joining us today and do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Goodbye.